Welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left Show. This week, we're going to be discussing housing and homelessness with a number of guest speakers. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're recording the show on stolen land. For myself, I'm hosting this discussion from Wadawurrung Country, and I'd like to pay my respects to ancestors past, present and emerging. Always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'd like to introduce our guest speakers. Today we've got Emily Bullock, who is a New South Wales public housing tenant whose current housing um, is at threat of being sold and demolished by Housing New South Wales. We've got Ange Carr, who's a housing and homelessness case manager and public housing activist. Sam Wainwright, National Co-Convener of Socialist Alliance and Fremantle City Council. And Amy McMahon, Greens MP for South Brisbane and the Queensland Greens spokesperson for Treasury Essential Services, Housing and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining the discussion today. Thank you. So we'll start off by getting a bit of an overview of what's happening in your respective states, because we do have uh, four states uh, covered here today. Um, so, Ange, we'll start with you in terms of what's currently happening in um, Geelong, specifically where you're based in Victoria, in terms of the housing and homelessness situation. Thanks, Sarah. So in Geelong, um, currently we're seeing... Um, presentations of people experiencing homelessness has really boomed. We're having a lot of people moving down from Melbourne into the region um, and this has put a massive strain on housing affordability and stock in the region. Um, in Geelong we have around, it's the last stats was probably around about 900 people in the region experiencing homelessness but I would anticipate it's actually a little bit higher than that. Um, we have probably, of those people, we have about 15% of people are sleeping rough, which is double the national average. Um, and in our region, about 64% of the homeless population are actually women. Um, and it's about the same statistic around the reason for that being the presenting reason is family violence. Um, we... In Geelong, um, and people might have heard about the Andrews government's um, big housing build or the money that they've injected into the housing sector recently. So they've put in around, I think it was $5.3 billion, but most of that is anticipated to actually go to community housing providers and not public housing. So what we've seen on the ground um, it's trickling in about where that money and how that money will be spent. But one of the things we have seen in the region is something called the Homelessness to Home um, project. So that came out of um, the state government's COVID response to rough sleepers. Um, and that was, so that was called the HEART program. So now we've seen, I think it's 118 support packages where they're taking long-term homeless cohort off the street and providing them um, with housing and then a wraparound support model for about 18 months. But the interesting thing to note in that is that those packages, so only a small portion of that is actually public housing um, and the rest of the housing packages are actually being delivered by community housing providers under head leasing schemes. So what that means is that they are there's some bulk purchasing happening, but some of it is private landlords um, are actually, there's been a rebate on rent. But at the end of 18 months, that rebate will be gone. So we're going to have a long-term homeless cohort now living in private rental properties and having to sustain full market rent. So this is honestly the most ludicrous Band-Aid solution we've ever seen because we're going to see that People that experience, um, you know, complex issues um, that lead them to being homeless, and they're not going to be able to sustain rent in a private rental market. Um, other things that we're seeing in Geelong is we have, it's only about 3% of our housing stock in this region is actually 
social housing. So that's public and community housing. Um, and of that at the moment, just over 3,000 properties are public housing and we have just under 1,000 um, community housing providers. Um, Data also shows since 2018, so homelessness has doubled in our region in 10 years. And I heard recently that something during COVID, something like 6,000 people had moved from Melbourne to Geelong in the last six months. So that puts a massive strain on our region. And another issue we have in Geelong is um, Airbnbs. So that's this would be an issue Australia-wide that Airbnb, that market, now removes sort of long-term rental properties for people that may need to rent. Um, I think that's probably a snapshot of some of the current trends that are happening in Geelong. Thanks, Ange. And Sam, from Fremantle's perspective, I think earlier this year, um, we saw there was a, a tent city or a, a housing, a homelessness camp set up to protest the situation there. But how are things going currently? Look like the rest of the country, they're pretty grim. Um, so we've just had this slow grinding housing affordability crisis affecting the whole country um, and particularly the big cities. And Perth is no exception to that uh, with, you know, rentals, quite private rentals, quite expensive and vacancies really low. Uh, and then if you add to that, um, there's just been a total and utter failure to in, invest in public housing by, um, uh, so, you know, both Labor and Liberal governments over decades, uh, federal and state. So um, to give you a sense, we've got a, um, there's a 15,000 applications on the waiting list for public housing in, in WA. Um, that's 15,000 applications. So that's more like, that includes families. So that's probably around about 45,000 actual human beings. Um, and the list is probably longer than that. If you consider all the people that, you know, struggle to afford um, the private rental market, but aren't poor enough to even qualify for, for, for public housing or the people who've been on the list, but they've moved how, you know, they've, they've moved, um, you know, you, you get a letter, um, every year just asking if you still want to stay on the list and if you don't respond you get taken off the list that sort of stuff so and then there'd be there probably people in addition to that who just don't even bother trying you know so the the real waiting list is i don't know what but it's it's an effective waiting wait time of seven years um and and fifteen thousand applications um and it, it the 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 problem has really just come to a head recently so it was in that con you know, you know COVID has exacerbated this and so it came the the tent city that sprung up in Pioneer Park, which is just across from the Fremantle station, uh, really dramatised this. Um, and both the housing activists and the people who were staying there themselves, um, they were conscious of the symbolism of the of the spot where they were establishing their tent city. It's not. It's it's by no means is it the first or only tent city that's that sprung up around around Perth. Um, but they were quite conscious of the fact that they were going to be directly opposite um, Simone McGurk, who's a member for Fremantle and um, the minister responsible for, for, for communities, you know. Um, so it was really in the face of, of the um, of the Labor government here and they were hopping mad about it, you know. It was so embarrassing for them. And so they just sort of, you know, dismissed it as a political stunt run by anarchists or XR or this, that and the other, you know, asserted that the <clears throat> that the grassroots housing activists who were who were supporting it were you know taking advantage of vulnerable people and all this sort of stuff I and mean, of course the logic of this argument was just rubbish you know because uh, you know how are rough sleepers any less vulnerable if they're not sleeping in a in, in, a, in a park but just you know in doorways and laneways spread across the city it doesn't make them any less vulnerable it makes them more vulnerable i would have thought so it, the, the, the response of the state government was absolutely terrible. It was disgraceful. They just passed the buck and they lied and this sort of stuff. At the time, the Premier insisted that there were there was no need for people to be sleeping rough in Fremantle because there were plenty of crisis accommodation uh, spots available. Well, I can tell you as a, as a council of City of Fremantle, who had a direct report from our, our director of um, community development, there were no spots available, you know, so the Premier just lied about it out, outright, you know. Um, so there's, yeah, so the situation is grim and it's particularly grim now, um, given that the eviction on, on private rentals has been lifted, coinciding with the wind back of JobKeeper and JobSeeker. So if you'll just give me a moment, I'm just looking now at a, at a report that Shelter WA put out and they say that with the, um, 
with the lifting of the um, the ban on evictions and the and the wind back of job seeker and job keeper that they have a, have they have had a five hundred percent increase in calls uh, that seventy one percent of those people are facing evictions that eighty six percent of people to calling their line saying they can't afford basics you know like electricity and food that a hundred percent have had a, a a rental increase and a hundred percent of those people can't find another rental and it's it's interesting this 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 kind of hidden homelessness you know because people are familiar with rough sleepers that you say homelessness that's what people think but of course the majority of homeless people are, are actually people who are couch surfing or staying sleeping in their car or bouncing from friend to friend or whatever they're doing you know um but there's a real awareness that this is starting to, to gather pace now and even just in my local community for I've, I've never seen this before um just i know it's just an anecdote but like three i've seen three posts on just local community forums on facebook people saying oh hi folks you know i've got a friend um she's a single mom trying to get away from a dv situation um you know two kids one dog maximum she can afford is 300 dollars. anyone got any leads that sort of stuff and that, that's just sort of becoming commonplace you know um so it's pretty yeah it's frightening it's drastic um and notwithstanding all the criticism or, or limitations of the announcement that the state government in victoria has made uh, that's good compared to what we've had our state government has in real terms has promised 1300 new public housing dwellings in 10 years in 10 years can you believe it and they're running a surplus so yeah it's a very serious problem emily by way of your introduction you mentioned that you're facing potential eviction um from sell-offs and demolishing so yeah tell us about what's happening in new south wales yeah. oh thank you sarah um i want to support you in your uh, recognition that we're on stolen land and uh, yes, well, I have lived in the same public housing flat for 30 years and they are doing this 30-70 divide, i.e. 70% of the property will be sold to private, 30% will remain, but it won't be public, it'll be handed to a community group. So as far as I'm concerned, the New South Wales government will not have any inch of the land under its, uh, it's just getting rid of it. It doesn't want to have to deal with any tenants at all. It doesn't want to have to deal. So they're getting, handing everything over kind of to uh, these housing providers, whoever they are. We have no idea who these housing providers are. And Oh, do they, they are entitled to the federal um, uh, allowance, the rental allowance, uh, but as a public tenant, they don't get that. So that means the New South Wales government under these housing providers gets approximately $70 more rent. So it makes it kind of econo more economical for them, not that it makes it economic. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, getting rid of the land is the, the second theft because it's being stolen from the public purse and given to developers and given to housing providers. New South Wales is trying to move all the tenants kind of out of Sydney City, where I live, and Sydney City uh, used to have, I think it was something like 5% public housing. It's now down to about 3.5%. But that figure I'm just pulling out of my memory. I couldn't find it for a fact. So that the sort of constant move the poor out of the eyes. We also have a, um, a homeless problem where I live in Glebe. There is um, a bridge with uh, about 10 arches and the arches are full. About every five years, five of, sorry, three months or so, people get moved on. Well, and then they creep back and the arches get filled. So now we'll turn to Amy McMahon from the Greens. Thanks for having me. Uh, we know that uh, we've got woefully inadequate social housing here in Queensland at the moment. We've got about 47,000 people who are on the social housing waiting list. That includes 16,000 children 
Some people have been on that list uh, for many years and we know that it's only those people who are the most vulnerable who are able to get access to housing at the moment. The Queensland Government's uh, housing strategy we know is woefully inadequate as well. Um, their plan had been to build um, about 500 uh, homes a year. We know that they're not meeting um, their own targets. And in fact, looking at some of the Productivity Commission data suggests that um, we're very behind in terms of actually building our stock of social housing in Queensland. We were also asking some questions this week about the sale of public housing, public housing being sold off on the private market um, and not much clarity about what's being done with that money, if that's being reinvested into housing. Uh, we also know that the existing social housing stock is uh, meant much of it is very poorly maintained. Uh, it's very old, um, really needs a lot of attention. So the Greens plan in Queensland is to build 100,000 public homes right across the state. The plan is to not only clear the social housing waiting list, but to, to make homes available to any Queenslander who wants it. That housing shouldn't just be available to those who are most vulnerable, but any Queenslander who wants to live in a social home. And I think this is really important because this is part of how we um, make sure Queenslanders have a home, we cool down the housing market, we reduce stigma around social housing. Um, but the first thing absolutely is to make sure that we clear that social housing waiting list and give those 47,000 people um, a place to live. And you started to speak about like some of the response from the Victorian government in terms of their 5.3 billion for social housing. Um, but we've also seen some changes to um, the actual office of housing and some corporatization going on. Did you want to speak a bit more about that? And I probably should have said earlier that as a state, Victoria is way behind the other states in um, the availability of public housing. So our state government has actually neglected public housing for decades now it is. So one of the biggest changes we've actually seen is like Sarah said, the corporatization and the push towards the privatization of the housing sector. And so the government started this in a clever rebranding kind of um, scheme a couple of years ago when the term social housing became the norm when talking about public housing and community housing. So both community and public housing have now been branded under the same umbrella of social housing. Um, and by doing that, when the government talks about social housing, people think, oh, that's a good thing. And they think about public housing, but it's a way to now start to privatise, which is what they're doing. And we're seeing this in the 5.3 billion big build, that that money is going to the community housing providers. Um, so I might talk about the differences between public and community housing. So obviously public housing is owned and operated by the state. Um, people that live in public housing only have to pay 25% of their income and they have a much more secure um, tenure. So in my role, in my previous role, I case manage both public and community housing tenants. And I can tell you when having to case manage um, community housing tenants at risk, you know, they just have a lot less rights than people in public housing. Um, and also the staff in that Office of Housing, which is now being renamed Homes Victoria, that sort of went under the radar during COVID last year. Um, they are just a lot easier to deal with and they understand the complex, complex needs of some of the tenants. So community housing providers, currently in Victoria, I don't know what it's like around the rest of the country, but in Victoria, they're not all regulated. So they all have their own individual rules, policies and things like that. They're supposed to only um, charge rent at 30% of one's income. But in reality, I've worked with tenants who have been charged, you know, 50% of their rent to live in a community housing property. Um, what we also see is because they're for profit, um, most of these community housing providers, 
they if people fall behind in their rent they're you know running to vcat a lot quicker than um, officer housing would be and they don't try and work with tenants to resolve whatever the issues um, that they're actually experiencing that leads to them not being able to pay rent or you know different issues that tenant tenants might have so you know they just want they don't want people with complex issues they're supposed to um, when a property becomes available what we've seen in Geelong is that they're supposed to take a person's name off the housing register but in reality they're handpicking tenants they'll call a number of people they invite them to inspect the property and then they'll run an interview so they are only going for tenants that present um, without complex issues and they also want people that have um, a higher income than Centrelink incomes because they're for profit and then they can make more money. Um, one of the other big issues, so we've seen like with all these developments, the knockdowns of the old towers in Melbourne and then selling them off to developers and then community housing providers operate the other units. Well, the reality is these community housing providers, they can charge 75% less of market value if it's in an expensive area. So what that basically means is if you've got a flat that would be $500 in Melbourne, you know, you're still having to pay $400 per week. That is not affordable. Um, so it's a real fallacy that this is affordable, safe and secure housing. And so what we've seen in Victoria is we are now moving away from public housing. So the government is actually trying to privatise and move the whole sector into the hands of, um, you know, the private community house market. And it's an gonna be an absolute disaster for anyone that is on Centrelink or has social health issues, those types of things. You know, there is no security in living in community housing. Sam, we'll go to you because recently WA had their state elections mid-March. Um, so I'm just curious as to how much of an issue this was in the state elections there. And from a local councillor perspective, has there been much um, discussion at a Fremantle City Council level about social housing or, or putting restrictions around new development? In the lead up to the state election, the issue of homelessness and the housing affordability crisis got quite a lot of coverage because of the because of the, te the tent city, basically. Um, and I think there was an important lesson in that because some of the, the sort of housing advocacy organisations or welfare organisations were, were critical of the tent embassy. And they really, in my opinion, you know, did the wrong thing by joining in state government criticism of the tent city saying, oh, they were putting vulnerable people at risk and, and, and this, this sort of thing, um, and distracting them from accredited service providers and, and this sort of thing. The, the argument was, was a false one anyway, because the, it doesn't really matter where people get their lunch or the dinner from, if they're homeless, they're still homeless. So, and the, the tent city in the, in the park wasn't stopping people from a accessing what other services they could still get from other, you know, so-called accredited service providers. But the central problem was just the lack of housing. Um, so it was quite, it did loom quite large in, in Fremantle. I guess across the state as a whole, it's hard to judge because the state election was really just a, a referendum on how the state government had handled COVID. And so there was just a massive, massive swing to, towards Labor um, and they were returned with a thumping majority. So it's a bit hard to know under the surface how much people were, were concerned and feeling this housing affordability crisis. It's certainly bubbling away in the media quite a lot quite a lot now. Uh, just another thing I wanted to just briefly sort of just to, just attach, uh, go back to something that, that, that Angela uh, mentioned, if, if that's all right, is, is the fact that um, this, this thing about, um, you know, social housing, you know, community housing versus public housing. We, we've had a similar process in WA of the state government effectively, you know, um, handing over housing stock to uh, not-for-profit um, housing providers. Now, without being an expert on the topic, my sense is that um, those um, there's, there's there's better protections for tenants in uh, in uh, tenants of those community housing providers than what it sounds is the case in Victoria. In terms, it's still the same amount of rent and, and that kind of thing. And just anecdotally, from some of the tenants I've spoken to, they don't necessarily feel that they're particularly worse off um, being tenants of those organisations per se. Um, and in fact, uh, our 
the housing authority here um, is in terms of ten security of tenure can actually be quite problematic itself. So it's, you know, this the, the existing housing authorities can be pretty unresponsive, un, uncaring, unkind bureaucracies in their own right. So in WA, we have a really serious problem of the so-called three strikes and you're out rule, um, which applies to public housing tenants, uh, where if you've had three complaints made against you, which the, which the housing authority substantiates, then you can be kicked out onto the street. And those three complaints, you know, for instance, imagine, you know, uh, could be the police being called to your place. But that, you know, the how there's there are documented cases of the housing authority even using a situation where someone who is the victim of violence calls the police for their own protection. Um, and there's an incident, you know, the neighbor, you know, nosy neighbors ring up the housing authority and that goes down against them as 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 one of the three strikes you're out. It's unbelievable stuff. So we've we've literally had single mums with kids kicked out onto the street um, under under those circumstances. So the existing housing authority is not not great in WA either that that's such i want to make that point but there's still and but even if the um even if you apply the same rules um in terms of rent and that sort of stuff to these not-for-profit housing providers there's still a problem because i think there's a number of problems that still present one is we still have the problem that 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 Ange talked about of those providers picking and choosing which tenants they want um and that then creates a really bad dynamic where the, the tenants with, you know, the only provider that will pick up the, the tenants with really complex needs is, is the public housing provider. And that then reinforces this negative image in, the, in, in, in Australian discourse, which exists at the moment, that, oh, you don't want the public housing, you know, tenant from hell like that you saw on Today Tonight living next to you, all that sort of stuff. It just sort of feeds into that negative, uh, negative discussion and dynamic. Um, I think, but I think there's also, there's two other problems with devolving all this um, public housing to these not-for-profit providers. The other two problems, um, and I say this saying that there, there I think there, there, there's, there's an argument that there's a place for some of these providers. Like if people want to be in co-ops or Aboriginal community controlled housing providers, that sort of stuff. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being absolutely dogmatic about it, saying there's no possibility for it. Um, but certainly in the case in WA, and I'm sure in the other states, it's just big slabs of just regular, regular housing is being handed over to, 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 to these organisations. Um, the, the other two problems with it is one is that um, it breaks down the idea that the provision of this housing is a government obligation. That's a public service. It's like schools or hospitals and sort of turns it into this sort of subcontracted charity, optional extra kind of thing that the government's not fundamentally responsible for. I think that's one problem. The other problem too, is that it also drives down wages and conditions of the workers in the sector. Um, so, you know, when, when it's being directly provided by the housing authority, they're public servants. Um, but if you, we all know that workers in the not-for-profit sector earn about a third less than public servants doing the same job. So that's, 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 that's kind of part of the problem as well. Here in WA, um, with the, the total stock of public housing has actually declined by 4% or 1,300 units in just four years. That's under a Labor government, that, that is terrible. Um, and we also have this issue of the housing, basically no new capital has been given to that, is being given to the housing authority whatsoever. You know? So the only, the only way they can, they can actually replenish their stock and renew stock, some of which is old and does need to de demolishing and you know doing up and all, all the rest of it, is is by doing mixed developments with private developers or by selling selling land in the inner city, which has got a high value, and building out in the suburbs. You know, but you can only do that once. You know, you can't keep going forever. You know, um, and the other, you know, the the rhetoric that's that's used to sort of justify this is, oh, you know, we don't want to create ghettos. We want mixed mixed public private kind of developments, that sort of stuff, and. I mean, in abstract, that's a that's a fine enough argument, but it only hold, holds good if you're actually building a sufficient quantity of new stock to replace the stuff you've you've been demolishing, which they just they, they have not been doing. So sorry, Sarah, I was took a that, that was a roundabout way to get to your point. So that's been happening in Fremantle because Fremantle is gentrifying. It's quite you know it's getting pretty expensive, um, and we've seen a lot of housing, um, hundreds and hundreds of I, I can't give you the exact number, but it's probably running to about six or seven hundred dwellings have been demolished in Fremantle and not replaced um, and the state and 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 there's also blocks of land huge blocks of land um, dotted around Fremantle which was supposedly going to have mixed developments on them so you know 80 public housing apartments get demolished and supposedly there's going to be a new mixed development high density with say 40 you know it's only 40 public housing developments to replace it but they haven't even done that so it's just going down and down and down and down like they're just it's just not our priority for the state government, pure and simple. They just don't give a shit, you know? Um, so that's the problem we've got. And it's very, it's actually very difficult for local governments to do much about it. Um, 
collection of, you know, local governments are just a, a creature of a local government act. They're established by the state government. So um, the state government doesn't have to ask our permission if they want to demolish, you know, if you're a private landowner and you want to demolish a house in Fremantle, you need, you need planning permission, but the state government will just, just do it. You know, they just do it. And that's that. Um, and we don't have many mechanisms to try and to try and compel a developer to include a portion of, public housing or social housing or even the looser affordable housing. We don't have many mechanisms to do that. We, uh, under WA law, we can only do it by incentivizing it. So for instance, you might say to a developer, okay, on this spot, you can do a four story apartment building, um, but we'll let you go to seven stories if you meet, you know, if you have 15% public housing or social housing, or affordable housing, that sort of stuff. So you have to incentivize it. So the developer would just say, oh, well, yeah, thanks very much, but I'll just do the four story building thing. Or, and then the other problem, of course, is if the state government is not giving any new capital to, to you know, to e either to the housing authority or to the or to the non-government housing providers, then this the developer is not going to get a partner anyway. So it, the whole thing just stalls. So that's what we've we've had happen in Fremantle. There's a number of sites where these incentives have been put in place, but there's no no one's got any money to do it. So it just it just stalls and nothing happens. I mean, certainly we I think as a, a, putting on my Fremantle council hat, we probably should and could have done more to sort of to dramatize the situation of our residents who um, you know, have been pushed out of our community um, uh, and to try to hold the state government to account on this question. But unfortunately at this stage, they don't seem to have show any, there's not yet enough public pressure. They don't feel any need to, to deviate from what they're doing. Amy, we'll cross to you now. What are your views? Right, so um... I guess there's a distinction between public housing that is owned and run by the government uh, and then community housing that can be owned and run by um, community organisations. Uh, often, um, you know, for people who have particular needs, maybe um, disability housing or youth housing would be in the community sector, Indigenous housing, where you've got um, Indigenous uh, owned housing that's run and owned by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities um, and I think there needs to be uh, a mix of both of these. Um, we definitely need uh, public housing that is run and owned by the government with the benefits coming back to the community uh, that's in public hands and in public control. I think that's really crucial. That's basically democratising our housing system but also making space for the community sector where there are organisations that can provide people with um, specific services. Um, and specific needs but in those cases there needs to be democratic oversight as well the tenants need to have a say in what's ha happening with that housing you know we've heard stories uh, about uh, community housing organizations that are selling off housing without any proper consultation with the, with the tenants that are that are part of that network of housing um, so that that democratization and um, you know having tenants having control over what goes on with that housing is really crucial Emily, we'll go to you next. I think I read an article, I think, in the last month or so about a inner city Sydney caravan park slash people living in their cars, like right in the heart of Sydney. Um, I'm curious, like off the back of that, has there been much response from the New South Wales state government, obviously beyond continuing to flog off what is left of public housing? Um, have there been any announcements or response? No, there haven't been any announcements. We did have a minor success in that they were demolishing, I think it was, you know, 25 flats, some of them three bedrooms, and they were going to build, you know, 25 one bedrooms. But now they're going, the whole site is going to be housing. So it's 75 uh, flats, and there are going to be five three bedrooms. What is an ongoing issue with the 3070 division is that like in my, and where I live, we have 108 flats, uh, yeah, 108 flats, of which we have five, four, three bedroom, two bedrooms, one bedroom, and some studios. And the, they won't, they go, you know, they keep on saying, oh, yes, but there'll be 120 new flats, but they're all going to be one bedroom and studios. So as shelter now terms it, there'll be fewer pillows because there won't be so many people living in the complex. There'll be fewer. 
we have the right of return, but how can you, as a, if you're a family of five people, return to a one-bedroom flat? And so it's not really a right of return. It's only the right of the return. And if you're, you fit in with the community housing people who only want the housing people here keep on calling the developments like a women's only development and, a, you know, over 55 development, you know, so that they can exclude you know, those people desperately in need. See, one, the building that they're, that they're going to make all housing was previously elderly folk. They then moved them into the commu new community housing and replaced them with youth in distress and only gave them six months leases. And the youth in distress have all been kind of moved out with when their lease is finished and we don't know where they've gone and they have, as far as I can see, bridge housing hasn't been supportive of them. I, you know, Sam made some points which I would 100% agree with, the same sort of thing is happening here in Sydney. It just, then instead of just saying, yes, let's make a development, they have to always make somebody else pay. They won't commit themselves to paying. So Sam um, touched on this with, you know, some of what's happening in the Fremantle and Perth area. Um, but in the context of campaigning against uh, violence towards women and children or seeking to end family violence, um, what is the importance of public housing and affordable housing? So, Ange, we'll go to you because you mentioned there's a pretty high presentation in Geelong at the moment um, in relation to family violence? So yeah, it's one of the key factors that women and children in our region experience homelessness, but uh, that's not unique to Geelong. That's, you know, that is the experience of people um, that experience family violence. Homelessness, unfortunately, ends up being um, the result of that violence. So Really, I public housing to me is the only option. And I think we need to look towards countries like Finland because what we have here in Australia, so the only people that end up in crisis and transitional properties in Geelong, and I would imagine that's like this everywhere too because of the lack of availability, is generally women and children, um, singles, um, you know, single people don't make it into our crisis accommodation. Um, but what happens is women might end up staying in a motel with their children. Then they go into short-term crisis properties for three to six months. Then they end up having to move into a transitional accommodation. That might be 18 months, um, you know, and then they might exit into private rental. That's generally unlikely from what we're seeing in the last five years. Um, or they'll end up in public or community housing. But what happens is women and children, they've had to flee violence and then their lives are upended. Um, you know, there's not enough mechanisms, there's not enough programs, there's not enough funding for women and children to remain in their home safely currently. And that's something we should be looking at too, getting the perpetrators out and making, you know, security and safety for women and children to remain, if that's a possibility. But women and children, they have to keep moving. So there's no way that people aren't stable. Um, children have to move schools. It just adds to the trauma people have already experienced. Um, but if we look to a country like Finland, so they have something called the housing first model. And there's other models like this across the world, but they're not the Finnish housing first model. So what they do is when people present to the entry points, like what we have, they're provided secure and safe long-term housing. And then they're provided a wraparound support model of, um, you know, it could be health, social workers, could be psychologists, doctors, depending on the person's presenting need. Um, and how Finland achieved this, so all levels of government, you know, charities, not-for-profits, they all got together and they just invested in building public housing. And that is what we need to happen here in our country. 
and it just stops that rigmarole of moving around and around and adding to the trauma that women and children are experiencing. And at the moment, you know, I have heard so many people say to me, you know, the ads on tally, they tell me to leave, leave family violence, and then they leave and they become homeless. They have nowhere to go. So people end up having to go back home to the perpetrators because there are just no other options. Mm -hmm. You're either sleeping, if you've got a car, you know, and it's so, it's appalling in homelessness services. If you've got a car, you're a lucky person because you can sleep in that you know, that's not lucky. That's a horrible situation for women and children to have to experience. So we really need to look to a model like Finland. That's what we all need to be advocating for um, because women and children have a right to safety and they need they need housing. They need somewhere to go. Thanks, Ange. Um, Sam, I guess further to the comments you were making before about this, you know, three strikes and you're out policy and, um victim of victims of violence um copying that um as a strike um has there been much response to that from say like family violence services or advocacy groups to like get this to stop happening yeah look there has i mean that's while it's still a terrible situation and it still exists there um you know it's, it's affected aboriginal people particularly badly uh, particularly you know single Aboriginal mums, you know, I would say. And th there's been some great grassroots responses. And the First Nations Housing Project is an example of that. And so that's an organisation that's both attracted funding, but also volunteers. And they, um, you know, they go around and mow people's lawns and, and, you know, fix broken doors and do that sort of stuff. You know, when when public housing tenants, you know, single mum who's, you know, absolute flat chat, trying to, trying to get, you know, multiple pots on the boil. Um, and, you know, you can imagine you've got a housing inspection that's going to be, you know, in two days time and you'll be kicked out if, if the place isn't cleaned up. So, you know, they've been sending in teams of people who actually go and do that stuff, you know, which is just fantastic. It's really, really inspiring stuff. But, you know, it still doesn't get to the overall problem, which is, is just, the, the, just the shortage of housing. So we have the same thing here, like across Perth. A few years ago, the, the figure might change, but when, a few years ago at least, and I'm, I presume it's worse, is that on any given night, like 100 people have turned away from crisis accommodation for, for family and domestic violence in, in, in Perth. And then we've got a seven-year waiting list to get into, into long-term housing. Um, now, you, you can be on the priority list, but the priority you can still like wait up to two years if you're on the priority list. And so I think it really dramatises the fact that how can, how can we... You can't possibly create a society that's free of family and domestic violence if we don't live in a society where housing is treated as a human right, where access to a dignified, affordable housing is a basic obligation of the government. And it's the government's obligation to ensure that everyone can get it, just like we do with healthcare and education. Um, and until we achieve that, how are we going to get to the bottom of this problem? You know, and that's not, and that's without even mentioning all the people who. They may not be violent, you know, but who are just in unhappy relationships. They've just fallen out of love. They don't get on anymore. Who, who, who can't afford to leave. I mean, how many people are being made miserable in our society? How many people do you come across who are cranky and not very nice to you or something like that? Because they're just unhappy in their lives, you know? This housing affordability crisis is just, excuse the language, it's just fucking up people's lives, you know, on a scale we can't even imagine, you know? And the housing, the family and domestic violence is just the most sort of brutal and urgent sort of manifestation of it, I, I would have said, you know. And um, I think just on that question about the Finnish model, the housing first thing, I mean, one thing that really drives me wild is our state government will, will, you know, put a few little crumbs of funding aside for, for, a, for a sort of a so-called wraparound housing first model for like 20 people here or 30 people there. And they say it's housing first. It's no if you actually want to study the Finnish model, housing first means there is no queue. You can't have a seven year waiting list and say we're doing the housing first model. That's just not possible. You know, and that's the problem we've got, you know. Absolutely. Thanks, Sam. Um, and Emily, in terms of, yeah, again, what's happening in New South Wales or Sydney, do you have anything further to add? Our waiting list is theoretically 60,000 and the emergency waiting list is about 20,000. And so people, single people, they're building single dwellings only, only have to wait about five years, but families are having to wait about 10 years. So, and there it seems to be no ability within the present department to deal with the, um, you know, underuse 
such as, you know, my neighbour, she's uh, single and she's uh, in a three bedroom. She has to pay $10 extra for the second, for the third bedroom. And I don't just think, you know, like maybe if they could encourage people like her to move into smaller places, but they can't seem to get a policy to do that, to encourage people to move to smaller places, although they say it is, is happening. And the, the thing is that Glebe has this historic area, like the rocks, which they've sold off completely, Miller's Point, the rocks, which they've sold completely now, and um, they're selling off those individual dwellings as people die, you know, move out. So they're just sort of uh, cleaning them up, pulling every plant out of the garden and selling them as a shell so that people can't go and squat there. I don't know, I'd love some advice, you know, a pamphlet on how to squat that we used to have in London. But they seem to, it seems to be a thing of the past. And Amy, would you like to comment? Look, we know that uh, not having a safe place to go is one of the biggest deterrents for people who are trying to leave uh, abusive relationships. If we had uh, enough housing, people would be able to go to a safe place um, and start their lives again. But we know that there are so many people, and particularly uh, women and children, who are in a really tough position. If they don't have anywhere to go, if they don't have any other secure housing or secure income, uh, they're, they're in a really difficult position in terms of not being able to leave um, those situations. So we urgently need um, more housing. A crisis accommodation is a good step, but, but it's, it's really important to remember that crisis accommodation isn't housing. One of the things we saw from the government this week was um, them arguing that crisis accommodation can be counted as part of their um, public housing metric. But crisis accommodation isn't housing, it's not a long-term solution. It's just a stepping stone to people being able to find um, long-term secure housing. So I think as we're talking about the sexual assault crisis that we've got here in Australia, uh, making sure we've got enough housing is an absolutely crucial part of the conversation. So we've had a bit of a discussion and Ange, I think you started to answer this question of, you know, social housing, community housing, public housing, what are the differences? What should we be campaigning for? And it is all very convoluted. And I think you sort of touched on that politicians like to deliberately, um, you know, obfuscate these terms and make it as confusing as possible. Um, but I want to put this in the context of something that has occurred recently in Melbourne in the city of Yarra council where as part of the 5.3 billion big housing build the labor state government offered um, what would have been community housing to Yarra City Council and there was a split um, between Greens, uh, ALP and a socialist aligned councillor and the majority faction voted it down um, because it wasn't public housing. So they took this principled position of it's not public housing, so we don't want a bar of it. So um, I'd be curious to do a whip around. I think everyone here strongly feels that public housing is the way to go. Um, but in a context of such a crisis, um, should councils be doing this? Should councils be taking whatever they can get? Um, so, Ange, I'll start with you. I think it's a really difficult question. So in terms of, um, and I can see both sides of it. So as someone that works in the sector, and if you think about the sector response, um, people in our sector, people we work with and the staff, you know, it is not, we're absolutely at crisis point. So I can see how, um, you know, the temptation to take whatever you can get is there because there really are people in need, desperate need. But the problem is, you know, it's a slippery slope and we're already on this downward trajectory. Um, and 
you know, we need to advocate against community housing. I feel really strongly about that because once we start just letting all these developments in, you know, we're never going to get public housing back. It's only going one way at the moment. So we need to campaign against that. And I mean, when you start giving public land to developers, they're making a bazillion on this. They're making a profit on our public land. So I, I understand um, why Yarra Council took that stand. Um, and, you know, I'm happy they did that in the political sense because they are trying to advocate for public housing because that's really as a community and a society where we need to be going. Sam, as a councillor yourself, I'm not sure if you faced a similar dilemma or, you know, perhaps one might come up for you in Fremantle, but yeah, what are your views on, on the decision that Yarra City Council has taken? Look, I think the, that particular debate sort of shows up just how little, um, how, how few levers local government has, has actually got to pull to, to, to try and make something good happen in this space. Um, I mean, really, the, only, the if you're a local government, the only land where you can actually put a caveat on what it's used for is land that you own that you choose to sell, you know, uh, that freehold land. Um, that, that you choose that, that you choose to sell because you don't need it for other community purposes anymore and you think okay well we might as well make a capital gain use the money for something else and we'll we'll set we'll sell it for housing um, and we'll put some conditions around it um, but that's you know um, you know and obviously you're going to make what you think is the it, hopefully the council will make the best you know what it thinks is the best decision in, in, in that context but it's well, we're talking about very small amounts of land, really. It's, it's not going to, my, my sort of response is it's not actually going to make a decisive difference one way or the other. And let, unless the state government is actually putting lots of money on the table for new housing, then, you know, um, it, it's sort of a bit hard to say. I, I, I mean, I think in, in the context of Fremantle, if, if a developer wanted to, um, you know, partner with a, with a, um, a community housing provider um, to help get their, you know, get enough money on the table to build their, their new block of apartments, um, I'd, 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 on that level, I'd still, I'd still welcome it without, you know, without, without taking away from all the points that people made about why we actually want properly democratic, accountable public housing. You know, we don't want, don't go, we don't want state governments kind of washing their hands, hands of it. I also think there's, if, and if, sorry to, to, to chuck in another sort of theme at this point, but, but I think it also does pose the question of how do we, how do we popularise the idea of getting more public housing um, in, in the general Australian pop population? You've got to realise that like, our, our, our total stock of public housing in Australia is only 4% of our housing stock. Like that is minuscule, com even compared to other OECD countries. You know, like France, it's about 17%. Denmark, it's about 20%. The uh, United Kingdom, I think it's about 12 or 14%. So we, it's, you know, public housing has shrunk down to such a tiny percentage of our housing stock that most most working Australians just regard it as being welfare housing. You know, it's for people on welfare payments. They don't want it. They don't identify with it. They don't want it in their neighbourhood because it does, they feel it'll just drive down prices and bring the wrong kind of people in my street. That kind of stuff, you know, and it gets pumped up by today tonight. People can't even imagine it. You know, uh, that's the problem we have. I mean, I always say to people, be very, very, you know, be aware. You know, what they have done to public housing in this country by grinding it into into the ground and just turning it into like welfare safety net housing is what these neoliberals would do to, to healthcare and education if they could get away with it you know they've, they've destroyed the idea of it being a universal right and an obligation of government and so how do we win that back in people's imagination you know when they don't even know what it is they don't know what you're talking about a lot of the time you know and i think i think one in, in socialist alliance in the last state election campaign one thing that we did to try and engage in that conversation conversation i can't really tell you how successful it was or not but is that we put put the well there's two things we said one was you know um we need to legislate proper protections for private tenants um and that includes getting rid of no fault evictions and you know capping rental increases to cpi which is pretty uncontroversial it happens in other oecd countries but in terms of this question of public housing is you've got a whole bunch of people under mortgage stress you know because 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 our stock of public housing is so small and because we have bugger all protections for private tenants in Australia compared to other countries. The only way you can get housing security in Australia is to own. That's why it's an Australian obsession is, is to own your own house. In, in other countries, you could you can you can rent for 40 years. It's fine. You can do up the kitchen, you renovate the kitchen and you know you won't be kicked out. You know, if you if you're a good tenant, you can't be kicked out in a country like Germany, for instance, you know, except under very precise circumstances. That's that's why I have this, you know, people totally overstretched in the mortgage market. So 
to back to the point I was trying, I was, I was meaning to say is that one thing that we suggested in our state election campaign was that if you are facing a default on your mortgage, the state government should actually be offering to buy you out, you know, and 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 buy buy out your housing, absorb that housing into the public housing stock, and let you stay there. So you can still stay in the dream home to, till the day you die. That's fine. But we we grow the stock of we grow the stock of public housing that way. Um, because there's there's a lot of empty houses, <laughs> you know. I, I mean, I, I read recently there's more empty apartments in, in 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 Melbourne than there are homeless people, you know. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of empty, you know. So it's not just a question of building new housing, but actually just folding some of the existing housing um, into the in, in, into the public housing into the public housing sector. We need to find a way that people imagine, you know. Um, imagine public housing differently from, from what they do in Australia. Absolutely. Thanks, Sam. And yeah, Emily, any views? Yeah, well, um, I, will, I will support what Sam said. I want, I mean, I don't know whether you in the other states, but in New South Wales, the, um, the council loses when they create a state, if they want to put a 15 storey building in a low rise area they create a state significant site and take it out of the council's hands. That's what they've done in Waterloo, Waterloo Redfern, which you probably read about. So it's now under the, the council has no um, right to object. They don't have to apply for a DA. They can build whatever they want because they've created a state significant site. And that's another way that the New South Wales government is controlling the council so that the council can't councils can't control their own little areas um yeah i think that's all but i agree with sam that we need to things like real protection of private tenants of all tenants is and would help and also in sydney we have thousands of empty apartments I was hoping to have a bit of a discussion about some of the grass grassroots response. And we'll come to you. I know it's sort of fairly early days. We've got a new action group um, starting here in Geelong, but would you like to talk a bit about that? Thanks, Sarah. So yes, it is very early days and we're yet to have our first um, official organising meeting. So there's a small group of us at the moment um, called Homelessness Action Geelong. Um, but we have had really huge interest in this project um, and I guess some of the key things um, that we stand for one of them obviously is stopping the privatization of um, housing women and children that have experienced family violence should not be entering the homelessness system um, we need a big housing build right now not the 5.3 billion that's been promised we need to look beyond that we need something like 40,000 um, properties, public housing properties to be built across Victoria. Um, and we need to look at that housing first model that, you know, that is something that we should be aiming for in every region in Australia. Um, and another, we haven't, we're yet to ratify our list of demands, but another thing that's really important that we haven't spoken about today is increasing, I call them the poverty payments. So, you know, Centrelink payments, because People on Job Seeker that are getting $500 a fortnight do not have the hope of securing housing anywhere um, and certainly not in Geelong. So, you know, they need to be doubled those payments. We know that when the COVID payments, um, when they were increased, you know, some of the people we worked with, they could actually eat food every day. I mean, that's how bad it is for people out there. You know, you cannot rent, pay your bills and eat on these, you know, dreadful poverty payments. The DSP needs to go up as well. Um, you know, the costs of living are high now. So these are all contributing factors to why people cannot afford to rent. Um, so there's some of our asks, but we are gonna be an activist group. We are gonna get out on the streets. You know, we wanna educate people in the broader community. I heard someone saying before about how do we um, make people realize that you know, housing is a human right. So that is the message we want to get across to people. I know in Melbourne, there's a, there seems to be in the last couple of years, a lot more um, activist groups popping up because we are in the most diabolical situation that we have been in. Um, 
And, you know, so we've got to harness that rage and that passion and we've got to, you know, get out there and all support each other. And I know the Renters and Tenants Union in Melbourne, they've been doing a lot of good stuff too. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what's happening on the streets in Geelong at the moment. And homelessness, we have our National Homelessness Week in Australia in August. So I'd like to be hoping to plan a lot of actions around that time. Awesome. Thanks, Ange. Um, Sam, yeah, in terms of um, Fremantle, since the um, tent city popped up, has there been, I guess, any recruitment or planning in terms of further actions? Look, I can't tell you what further actions are planned, but I think one thing that was really important about the tent city that happened is, for, is that for the first time in the media, you actually saw rough sleeping homeless people speaking for themselves. You know, not just being people who talked about in patronising terms, and um, but people who actually have political agency as well. Um, you know, a, lo- a lot of the, you know, one of the unfortunate things is a lot of the agencies that that are contracted to provide services by the state government, um, you know, don't want to bite the hand that feeds them. And so there was a bunch of the agencies, you know, that do, you know, immediate crisis support in Fremantle were really critical of the tent city. Um, I think I mentioned at the start, you know, they they were sort of criticising it for, you know, distracting people from accredited providers and this sort of stuff. But really, you know, you know, homelessness was on the front page of the newspaper in Perth for for about three weeks because of that tent city, and it wouldn't have been otherwise. Really, do you think if do you think if rough sleepers had started started up an online petition, um, anyone would have been paying any attention to them? No, they wouldn't. You know, and it's it really it really um, it really shocked people to see um, rough sleepers themselves actually speaking for themselves because they you know they were interviewed on you know on, on the media and speak about their situation and made it very clear they weren't being manipulated by anyone to be there this wasn't just this this couldn't be reduced to an election stunt so that was a really good um outcome of that that thing the other thing that i think we haven't yet seen develop enough in western australia is actually um public and community housing tenants organizations where the tenants speak for themselves so once again you know this it's kind of left to sort of charities and and kind of advocacy organizations not to say sometimes they don't do great work, but but you know we don't hear enough of the tenants themselves speaking, you know speaking speaking for themselves. I think that's that's probably something that, re- that uh, my sense is that's happened more in Victoria, um, but it, it, I'm not aware of any kind of pre-existing tenants organisation, public housing tenants organisation in, in in Western Australia. So once again, they're people who tend to be talked about, not talked to. Um, so look, I think if all these various sort of threads can come together, combined with this growing awareness of um, the link between domestic violence and, and homelessness, you know, that um, as Ange said, you can't, you know, it's kind of like the government response to family and domestic violence is like a Hollywood movie set, you know, there's just those facades, but there's nothing actually behind it, you know. Um, so the people are starting to realise that. I think there's really, I think there are really opportunities to, um, to, to, to turn this question about the housing affordability crisis and homelessness into a um, into a mainstream discussion, and we've got to jump on board and make sure um, we don't get sold these um, these fake solutions. Emily, what's been the grassroots or activist response in New South Wales? Yes, well, I've been in sort of various in hands off bleeds as a as, as a grassroots organisation. And we tried to expand it when um, the issues around Millers Point happened and we tried to form a action for public housing. But although we had meetings, we couldn't sort of really get any action. But we did have a few rallies. We've got a rally on the 12th of May outside the New South Wales Parliament um, that is uh, supported the three three major um, rehousing situations with the seventy thirty the selling of public land, land of which we don't support and we're trying to get get changes. But with our liberal government at the moment, life is very difficult. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, absolutely. We do need to be taking it to the streets and taking it up to the politicians. And thanks to all our speakers, Ange, Sam, Emily and Amy for joining us for this discussion. And thanks to our viewers on YouTube as well. Um, Just a reminder, you can head to um, our website and become a supporter of Green Left to support the work that we do. Um, And 
Uh, please subscribe and share this video and tune in next week for the next episode. Thank you.